The Citroën C5 is an imported product, but Citroën's much-awaited made-in-India, made-for-India car is this, the C3. Honestly, every time a car maker says that, it scares me a bit because it usually means low-cost engineering, frugal engineering, and that ends up making the product cheap. But Renault surprised us with the Kaiga, the Quid, and its compatriot seems to be following suit. Does it? Let's find out. This one too has headlights in the bumper, halogen only, but this is not a Kaiga rival. That would be the new C3 Aircross based on this very car. And it will arrive in 2023 alongside a C3 Electric. That said, this C3 hatchback sits on a generous 2.5 meter long wheelbase, which makes it appear large, and it also has a taller stance than most conventional hatchbacks. While some manufacturers will shamelessly call this body style an SUV, <coughs> Ignis, uh, Citroën is insisting that this is a hatchback, but it has a crossover rivaling 180 mm of ground clearance and comparable suspension travel too. And Citroën takes its suspension and ride quality very seriously. Be it the 2CV from 1948 or the C5 Aircross that came to us in 2021, a supple ride is a must. And I'm happy to report that the ride quality is actually quite supple even on the C3. Of course, the suspension is pretty basic in its configuration. It's not as fancy as what you have in the C5. However, compared to a lot of low-cost hatchbacks or vehicles in this particular price bracket, the suspension setup is actually quite nice. It doesn't feel rickety. It doesn't feel to have that metallic clunk every time it's going through uh, a series of potholes or through the sharp bumps. It's nice and supple. It feels nice and pliant. It has a premium edge to it. So that's a big win for the C3 as far as the intent or the signature of Citroën is concerned. To demonstrate it better, let's revisit history. Now let's see if the suspension is good enough. For that, a bit of a history lesson. Remember the 1948 2CV? There was a very famous commercial which was in line with the brief given to the engineers of the car. The car has to be able to ply the B roads, the country roads, also drive through a ploughed field while keeping its occupants comfortable and a basket of eggs safe. Can the C3 do that? Let's find out. Okay, not a basket of eggs. It's in an old box that was for disposable masks because we still use them and there are about a dozen eggs. Let's see how many of these remain safe if we drive over not a ploughed field but bad roads because essentially that is what most of the customers of the C3 are going to drive over. So let's do that at 50 kilometers an hour and see how many of these eggs remain safe. I can hardly feel anything inside the cabin. I can have a regular conversation with you with no change to my voice. I hope my eggs are safe as well. I mean, the basket of eggs. And all the eggs are safe. All the eggs are safe. The Citroën 2 CV shall be proud. Good job, C3. Let's get on with it. Interestingly, this inexpensive suspension isn't too noisy. Where the car does feel a bit clunky though, is how the doors, bonnet or boot shut. And since we are nitpicking, the DRLs are LEDs, but all other lights in the front and the rear are conventional halogen bulbs. The rear windscreen doesn't get a wash, wipe or defogger even in the range topping crim. The key fob is basic and so are the door handles. The ribs in the front matting mess with the foot movement. The alloy wheels we showed you in the walk around video are only available as an accessory. There are only two trims to choose from and even on the top end spec, the feature list is pretty short. And on the entry spec, well, it's very bare bones. On the range topper, you only get two parking sensors at the rear but there is a provision for a reversing camera. And 
the parking camera is an absolute must have especially because these mirrors aren't electrically powered so sometimes if you have to get a good look of what's behind you and those two parking sensors not going to be enough you have to reach out for this and with the seat belt on it's very difficult to do all of this ah uh, so just get that reversing camera if it's available it's going to be safer there are no rear ac vents but you get two fast charging usb a ports there are two ports in the front too there is wireless apple carplay and android auto and while the screen isn't laggy the audio quality is pretty average from the four speaker system so this little notch here is for routing the cables but fat cables don't go through so it's not working for me right now and they'll also sell you a cradle to mount your phone right here it's a part of the 70 plus accessories list the last time i saw a factory fitted cradle like that it was the datsun thankfully this car is much better in terms of its quality miles ahead of what datsun managed in fact the plastics they are the scratchy type they are low rent of course but they don't feel low rent they don't feel bad to the touch or off putting to the touch there are no rough edges most of the shut lines are quite consistent i don't see the plastics or any of the panels scratching against each other that we've seen in some of the low cost cars in this particular price bracket or even lower but overall it doesn't feel too cheap inside and that's a good thing The big inlay panel which can be had in two colors looks nice and adds a youthful touch. And despite the dark upholstery used in the cabin, the large glass house makes the cabin feel quite roomy, which it indeed is. Citroen says that the seats are placed 100 mm higher and the shoulder room is 50 mm wider than a conventional hatchback and that essentially affords it better ingress and egress. The doors are also nice and wide at the front. At the rear, not so wide, but ingress and egress at the rear isn't a problem either you can simply just walk into the cabin in fact the height of the rear seats is slightly taller than even the front so that even the rear seat occupants get a good visibility let me show you here as well the window line is actually below my shoulder so getting a good view out even for shorter people or even for kids is not a problem at all speaking of kids this bench is only going to be good enough for two adults and a kid and that's because you see the integrated headrests only available at both the ends so that's only for two adults for the kids it's going to be a bit of a perch right here because this has a slightly elevated position and you also see a little bit more bolstering the scobs are a little fatter on this end despite the high seating headroom isn't too bad you can see that they've nicely scooped out the roof liner anyone who is about 6 feet is probably going to have a problem especially if the car bounces over a pothole or a speed hump you might end up hitting your head against the roof but honestly otherwise for my height of 5 feet 8 the headroom is not too bad the knee room also quite good and because the front seats are set at a higher position the foot space is also quite good though you have to be aware of these rails thankfully they have added cladding on top of it so overall i quite like the space speaking of the boot i would have liked these threads to be slightly shorter so that the angle of the parcel shelf would have been slightly higher that would make Uh, removing or loading the stuff easier now the loading lip is quite high the boot is quite deep that essentially means that you have to lift all your luggage while unloading you can't just simply pull it out but that's about it a weekend's worth of luggage for a family of 4 shouldn't be a problem at all however remember that the spare wheel is a space saver Speaking of road trips, there are two engine options to choose from. A 1.2 liter engine that can be had with an 82 PS naturally aspirated Avtar or a turbocharged 110 PS tune. Both these engines feed power to the front wheels via a 5-speed or 6-speed manual transmission respectively. Now the 1.2 turbocharged engine, it is i think the one to get that is the one i would choose if i was buying this car just because it's a nice engine there is not a pronounced turbo lag it gives you power on tap and i also like the performance of the 6 speed manual now the clutch lever it has quite a long travel however it's a very nice and light clutch so it shouldn't get too cumbersome in the city traffic now at launch it only ships with manual transmission options for both the engines but hopefully going forward there'll be automatic options added as well So this is the naturally aspirated petrol that I'm driving right now. 
Uh, you can also see these grey inlays in here. That's the other option that you get on the cabin. Otherwise, there is not much of a difference in the cabin. Everything remains the same. The gear shifter is different, of course, because this is the 5-speed manual. Uh, the clutch feel, the gear shift quality, all of that remains the same as the turbocharged petrol as well. Where it differs, of course, is because it's naturally aspirated, it's a bit peaky. You have to rev quite a bit to get anywhere. It's a bit sluggish of the mark. However, now, right now, I'm on an incline. There are about two people in the car right now with our luggage and everything, and it's not really struggling. The mid-range is quite good. The car cruises quite nicely, be it city speeds, be it highway speeds. So if you are purely looking at an urban runabout, you will not go wrong choosing either of these engines. Even the 82 PS feels quite adequate. In terms of the fuel economy, Citroën says that both these engines are pretty comparable, at least on the claimed efficiency figures. Both of them hover around the 19 to 20 kilometers to a litre mark. Both these engines are three-cylinder engines and as the revs rise, they make it evident that they are three-cylinder engines. And even when you come to a halt, there are these pulsations, these little vibrations in the pedal uh, that tell you that this is a three-cylinder configuration. On the move, in terms of the engine note, you don't quite hear the typical thrummy note of a three-cylinder engine. That they have muted quite well. But these vibrations are a quick giveaway that this is a three-cylinder motor. Using it in the city is absolutely a breeze. You get off the mark very cleanly. There is no turbo lag. There is no sudden surge of power. The turning radius is actually quite small, under 5 meters. The steering weight is quite good. The clutch, like I told you, is nice and light. Also, uh, the brake pedal feels nice and progressive. So it's a very easy to drive city car. So if this is going to be one of your first cars, you're not going to feel overwhelmed with anything inside the car. It's a very nice and friendly package. And that, I think, is one of its biggest highlights. I also like the shift quality on this gearbox. It's nice and smooth on the six-speed manual. It doesn't have that rubbery effect, doesn't feel clunky. The shifts are nice and uh, very sure-footed in that sense. And I quite like it. Couple that with the light clutch and shifting is an absolute delight on this car. I really wish that with this particular package, at least with the turbocharged engine, they should have given a rev counter on this. Unfortunately, there is no tachometer. You just get that simple multi-info display on all uh, the variants. And honestly, looking at what Renault's managed with the Quid or with the Kyger or what even Nissan's done with the Magnite, I was hoping to even see Citroën do something nice and colourful with that MID, especially when the rest of the car is trying to be so flamboyant. It is so flamboyant that MID ought to have been better. It just feels very meh. And, you know, you have those what look like gauges on either side of the MID. Those are actually spaces for the telltale lights, the fuel gauge, the temperature gauge, it's all within that MID itself. Yes, it has quite a bit of info like the trip, like the uh, fuel economy, etc. But I think they could have been a bit more creative, a bit more bold, maybe, with that MID. They haven't done that. It is easy to read, nevertheless. You only get disc brakes at the front, it's drum brakes at the rear but it's a lightweight car, it comes to a halt very quickly and uh, in a very sure-footed manner. Uh, even high-speed braking is not unnerving at all. And in fact, with the progressive brake pedal feel, it's quite good on the braking manners. The safety kit is pretty basic too, comprising of two airbags, two disc brakes and no Isofix child seat mounts. Because with that kind of a ride quality and the high ground clearance that this vehicle has, it does make a bit of a compromise in terms of the handling dynamics. There is an understeery edge to it around tight switchbacks. It does feel that it needs a little bit more effort at the steering from the driver's end. And there is a fair bit of vertical movement as well. But when I say that, I'm comparing it to other hatchbacks like say the Swift, the Bellino, the i20. But if you were to compare it to the Kaiga or the Punch, the body roll between these vehicles is quite comparable. I'm also happy that despite the space that it is going to dwell in, they haven't really uh, gone too skinny with the tyres. 195 section tyres on this range topping trim, uh, that's a very good set to go with. The high speed stability is actually quite good. The grip is also quite nice. So while I said that there is a fair bit of body roll around tight switchbacks, the vehicle never feels unnerving. There's enough grip and even at highway speeds when you're on long straights, 
the high speed stability is quite good. The only bit that is annoying is the beeper at 120 km an hour, which in this car is quite loud. Well, it's just started drizzling right now, but a little while back it has been hot and humid. And I'm pretty impressed with the kind of cooling performance that this cabin achieves, especially with these big air vents. However, because there are no AC vents at the rear, you usually have to keep the blower speed at minimum two so that the rear seat occupants are comfortable as well. And once you do that, it becomes quite noisy inside this cabin. And on the topic of rain, I'm not too impressed with the wipers. They leave a big chunk of unwiped area right at the bottom of the windscreen. And there is almost an inch and a half on the side of the windscreen as well. So not too happy with the wipers. In fact, even the wipers, they feel quite low rent, quite cheap. In a nutshell then, the Citroën C3 has a pretty basic features list which will leave you wanting for more. What works in its favour though are its youthful styling, surprisingly good ride quality for the segment, a roomy cabin and engine options which are above par on the specs and also promise to be quite frugal. All of which should excite those looking for practicality over a long list of features and creature comforts. Right, to sum it up then, it may not be an enthusiast car and that's only down to the handling, otherwise the engine and the specs would suggest otherwise. What I would say is that this is a very friendly city runabout. So irrespective of the engine that you choose, this is going to be the main highlight, the main characteristic of the car. And finally, I hope that Citroën doesn't get too ambitious with the pricing because with the kind of uh, scarce kit that it is offering, I hope that they price it really well. We've seen them being too ambitious with the pricing for the C5 and even for the other group brand which is Jeep. So we've seen them being quite ambitious with the Meridian and the Compass. I hope they do not repeat the same with the C3. I hope they really, really put this in as a game changer just the way the compatriots did with the Renault Kyger and the Renault Quid. If they do that, then certainly on the merit of its style, on the merit of its ride quality and on the merit of its overall flamboyance, I think the C3 could be a big winner.